Hello, hello. Awesome. Hello, hello. <laughs> Welcome to What Does the Afro Future Say? I am your host, Ingrid LaFleur, and I am with the gorgeous Janata Petros Nasa. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so excited to talk about your book and all your work. Uh, Janata and I met ooh, years ago, like five maybe, at, at an awesome... Yeah. I think so, at an awesome party uh, that Allied Media, during the Allied Media Conference, mm -hmm. a friend of ours, Asadala, love you, uh, oh, had, yeah. has these amazing parties and she was there. You had on like the best outfit. She's always has the best outfits on. <laughs> uh, and I instantly fell in love with her amazing, effervescent personality. Um, and then to find out that she's an amazing writer at the same time is just icing on the cake. Uh, thank you for being here. You are in Minneapolis right now, right? Minneapolis. I am in Minneapolis right now. I am in Minneapolis right now. How is it there? Is it warmer there? It's cold. How is it there? It's cold there? Yeah. Um, it's kind of chill in the air. I think like the reference of Minneapolis, because we're coming out of winter. Mm. So to me, like if it's in the 50s, it's still warmer than when it was in the negative 10, you know? So it's nice. It's overcast. It's a little dreamy and cozy, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the things I sort of miss, but I got the African sun, so I'm cool. <laughs> I mean, you in Africa, so here, I'm going to put us on Instagram Live. Is that okay? Oh, sure. That's fine. You, I should ask before. Is that okay for sure? It's fine. It's cool. I don't mind. Okay, cool. Because I'm like, oh, I don't want people to miss us in this vibe. And I, I posted know. it, but you know. All right. <laughs> this is me and Ingrid LaFleur getting fly. This is what does the Afro future say with my goddess in South Africa. Okay, cool. I'll you're sweet. Um, all right, so let's jump into it. Uh, first, I'd just love to hear some of your ideas about COVID-19, quarantining. What have you been thinking about? Any theories germinating? Uh, what am I thinking? I feel like I have super been inspired and grateful for the time to slow down. You know, like, I know that's not a thing everybody gets to do, you know? And so, like, there's certainly a part of me that's, like, I'm grateful to the ancestors and grateful to all of the, like, visionary aspects of my life that allows that, you know? But, like, there's certainly, it's just this gratitude. Because literally, I was on tour on the West Coast when it was really like, oh, this shit ain't play play. You know, this shit ain't a game. It's not cute. Get your ass home. Um, and I was exhausted. Like, I've been, you know, for the last, God, like, since I've committed to being an artist, which has been a decade now, so it feels like a cycle, you know, for me personally, an opportunity to be like, yeah, like, what is my alignment with my ancestors? What is my alignment with the cosmos? What is it that I want to be doing with my time? You know, how do I actually commit to healing myself? How do I actually, like, I feel like for me, I'm such an extrovert and I've been, I mean, I'm just like a busy body, like here, there, everywhere kind of person to some degree, but I'm a Cancerian and like, you know, in our souls, like we're deeply homebodies, you know? And I think there's a part of me that like, yeah, like I'll be out in the world doing my thing, yada, yada, yada. But like, I spend a lot of time home just like incubating and writing and so like, you know, I think for me, like, I feel like this is a transitional time for the globe, a hermitage, a, you know, sort of like hero's journey in a way. And I really do believe there's ways we can be more triumphant and alignment with ourselves cosmically, spiritually, sensually. Um, yeah, I mean, and I do feel very afraid for our people, you know, like, I feel like there's ways that oh my gosh, white folks be out here. <laughs> so, you know, I just be like, you know, man, like this is just a lot of uh, energies, you know, so many energies, so many shifts. And I just want to love and heal on the world, but I think I'm being forced to love and heal on myself. So. But you are loving on us with your book. <laughs> I got to, and I yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the stars and the blackness between us, right? Mm -hmm. Between them. Mm -hmm. 
between them. See, I put myself in the book. The stars in the book. The between them <laughs> is filled with cosmic healing, spirituality, magic. Tell us about this beautiful book. Yeah, I mean, this book came to me about like five years ago um, when I was, um, what was I doing? I was doing a lot of activism with Black Lives Matter. I was doing a lot of um, kind of just like artistry that was very like personal and emotional and like talking around like coming out into my queerness. I was doing a lot of circus art at the time, like, you know, sort of aerial circus art. So there was conversations I was having with the ancestors and with my spirit and my personal ancestors and queer ancestors and incarcerated ancestors. I just felt like I was just really full and tortured in this other way too, you know? Um, which I'm just a tortured spirit, you know what I mean? In a lot of ways, like I'm just super like feel for the planet and feel for like all of existence. And so, you know, at that time, like I remember specifically like having a shower and like the, and, and I'll just speak a little bit about what the book's about. So the book is about like, you know, um, these two black girls, one from Trinidad, one from Minneapolis, um, you know, being thrust into each other's lives in very, like, intense emotional moments, you know. Um, one was discovered in Trinidad with her secret girlfriend and got sent up to, um, to Minneapolis to live with her Black American dad, who she doesn't really know. Um, the other um, person is um, Mabel, who's this Black girl who's, like, a tomboy and, like, really close to her dad, and her dad has a garden called Black Eden that like, you know, it's kind of like their place to have their father daughter vibes. And he's like, and her mom are both like of the hip hop generation. Like they're both like, you know, kind of like Erica Badu, like Erica Badu and Andre 3000, but not really, but kind of like that sort of like black parent that exists, you know, these are like the Afrofuturist parent, you know? So like, you know, she and her dad are close and she's like, you know, feeling kind of ill and we discover she has a serious illness. And she also has like a sort of ancestral crush on Whitney Houston. So like, you know, she's always kind of like, you know, reflecting on Whitney Houston and specifically Whitney Houston's queerness. Um, so the book is very, you know, time travel It's very intergenerationally queer. Um, it's very, oh, and then there's like, a a situation or not a situation but there's a book within the book that the girls are reading by a man who's on death row who's an astrologer called the stars and the blackness between them so you know this man also is a very like cosmic spirit being and i have the book in case you know you want me to read and i'm actually gonna get off of the instagram live so y'all can jump on to the um look into my stories or feed or whatever they call it if you want to check out this awesome Zoom call, or is it too late for them to get on the Zoom call? Oh, I think it's, they can still do it. Yeah, they should be okay, able to. Okay, cool. Y'all should get on the Zoom call so I don't have to hold this up anymore. But this is my boo who's in South Africa and we talk in that good gets, oh, you know what? Maybe I could prop it up somehow. Maybe I'll just prop it up so I don't have to like hold it awkwardly. See, this is the shit that like I never think of till the last minute. So please forgive me, Ingrid. <laughs> I, we are here for your journey. Thank you, friends. <laughs> Afro for working together. See? Um, All love. <laughs> yeah, but um, gosh, what was I talking about? Well, you're talking about the book and the book within the book. Um, yes. So there's this man on death row who's kind of like this young, um, you know, went to prison when he was young and is an astrologer. Is kind of like this spiritual seeker and like the girls as they're like learning about themselves and connecting with themselves in their lives, you know, like are really, um, you know, identifying with this man's assessment existentially of blackness. So the book is like very spiritual. It's very emotional, um, you know, and it's been amazing to, um, yeah, it's been amazing to be a part of, you know, sharing this book and having these conversations with people about the book, you know, so yeah. I have so many questions. Uh, what are, oh, okay. Can you name a conversation that was like most surprising or moving that you've had recently about the book? Yeah, I think like, you know, this book has so many themes, like it has themes around queerness, like I said, but it also has a theme of kind of like spirituality and reflections of 
death, like in kind of, I would say almost like an Afrofuturist or a Black diaspora futurist, which is a thing I've really been appreciating like around this identity of like, yeah, I'm Black, I'm of the diaspora and I'm in the future, you know? Like sort of this dialogue with who we are spiritually, you know? Um, and how do we sort of reclaim things like death and dying, especially because there's so much death and dying that we have to absorb in this reality. You know what I'm saying? And I think there's a way that whiteness really terrestrializes us. So I remember this one mother, well, I was like at this random book club. I think, no, it was for, um, what is it? Well-read Black Girl, I think um, their Minneapolis um, one. And there was this woman there who was from New York and she was, um, you know, uh, yeah, just like, you know, woman of color, just there chilling, you know, talking about the book. And then at one point she shares like, yeah, you know, the reason why I'm in Minneapolis, because she had a New York accent, you know, and she's like, you know, I'm from New York. And the reason why I'm in Minneapolis is because um, my son is, you know, seriously ill and going to the Mayo Clinic or has like some chronic illness and, you know, um, and, you know, anyways, I happened to pick up this book. I don't know how she got my book, but she got my book and was reading it. And she said, you know, she's glad she found the book because it gave her insight into what her son is feeling, you know, mm. in the sense of like, what does it feel to be young and also have a body that's like in an existential situation between life and death, you know? Um, and in writing the book, I really wanted to like have a space for young people to think existentially about life and not necessarily because of death or the tension of death, but also because it's like, you know, we're taught to see our existence in this very white um, sort of like Christian narrative of like, oh, Jesus was killed and y'all is gonna die, go to heaven and God gonna do this and you're evil and middle of light. And it's just like, nah, our cosmology is so much wilder. And I think like, young people are also having to absorb the heaviness of young black death like that's just the reality you know so i also feel like i don't know it was just like this beautiful sort of opportunity to hear that i mean i've heard all sorts of like young people my favorite thing is like young kids on instagram because they will hit you on them dms <laughs> and just be like yo your book is my favorite book or they'd be like yo this is my favorite book like you know they'll just like keep it simple but they like yo this is my favorite book um, all these kids asking me questions about like how to go down on girls. Like I had a, one group that I visited in Harlem, these really amazing kids at an organization I used to work at, shout out Brotherhood, Sister Soul. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting with like one of their like sort of after school um, girl groups that are like, you know, these chapters of like, you know, um, rites of passage. And these girls were asking all kinds of questions about sexuality and pleasure and like um, gender identity, you know? So to me, like, I thought I was gonna come and talk about the book, but they wanted to talk about sex. They wanted to talk about bodies and pleasures and life and death, you know? So I feel like, like for me, I don't know, it's, it's been totally fucking dope to have written a book, you know? I'm gonna end it. Y'all check me out on, um, what you call on the Zoom, it's in my stories. Woo. Sorry, I wanna be more free with my hands. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so you know you said what i said i you said what? <laughs> yeah i'm such a hand talker you know yeah yeah um, um yeah go ahead uh geez we're <laughs> my brain is like flooding with um questions and i'm trying to figure out where to go next um you know Afrofuturism, I see as a spiritual technology. So as a result, oh, yeah. you know, your book for me fits within that space. Um, mm. oh. and, uh, and, I, and I love the, that it's for young adults. And I think that that's probably the most impressive thing. And it's between two black girls. And, and we need more of those stories. Um, that doesn't shy away from the magic um, that our culture mm. offers us, right? Uh, mm. That, and especially now when we're and dealing the sex with magic and the sex magic and the sex our magic culture, yeah, you know what I mean? Because I feel like so much of like spirituality is like so cerebral, and that's like a part of you know sort of these you know, hand-me-downs of this mm -hmm. culture, you know, if we're cut off from our sexual creative space and right. feel small or scared or shamed of it, mm -hmm. you know, that's like cutting some of our magic off, you know, and I'm, I'm talking about me, I had to figure that out, you know, right. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had to figure it out too. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm on my own queer journey, journey and it's been extremely magical to be partnered with a black woman. And I could, I, I, I'm always trying to articulate it because I think it's the perfect thing to have <laughs> during a pandemic. Um, it just to, I feel safer with a black woman. Uh, and because it's not just like a physical safety, I just know that her knowledge is so vast. I will be taken care of in all the, all in the most holistic way possible. And the love is just so healing and so beautiful uh, that it's making quarantining paradise, quite honestly. Mm. Uh, and mm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a beautiful journey. Um, I saw in your tweets you were um, talking about Little Richard and you mentioned queer divinity. And I just mm -hmm. really love that. Could you explain what that is? I think I know, but. I oh my gosh, you live it, you know it. But for sure, <laughs> like I think the way I've been thinking about it because, okay, and this is the Whitney Houston piece, you know, um, or the Whitney Houston lineage, mm -hmm. right? So much of like what, is essential to the soul of quote unquote American culture and American music and black music and like sensuality and sexuality and expression of femme identity, you know, is comes from black queerness, you know? And I think like little Richard, I mean, it's just, you know, it's like, it could have been anybody who was the architect of rock and roll, but it couldn't have been anybody but a queer black man from the South. <laughs> who like had the gospel in his marrow and I think so much of like you know and this is like I'm sh I know tons of people have perhaps written on it I mean I think it's a thing I think about a lot you know I um studied um black diet or what did I call it in college I studied like black diaspora studies you know so I studied abroad in Brazil like my family is Trini you know um and I think like so much of blackness and Africanness is just so like, it's an indestructible technology, you know what I mean? And I think specifically when we think about queerness and like black blues, you know, like that comes from like, you know, black women and black men like articulating desire and sexuality and loss and heartbreak in ways that, um, and like Sadia Hartman, I don't know, have you read any Sadia Hartman's work? Oh, yes, so please totally explain have it to folks. <laughs> Oh yeah, so Sadia Hartman, um, her book that I read recently, Wayward Lives and Beautiful Experiments, ever, this should be like everybody's like mm -hmm. necessary reading text. Mm -hmm. And she just basically like sort of follows in a very like ton, Toni Morrison-esque like, you know, prose, mm -hmm. um, the like, you know, longings and souls and like sex sexual journeys of like post-enslaved Black people you know and like talks about our migrations but talks about it like holistically and inclusive of all of our bodies and you know i feel like i um even before i was started writing this book even before i read her book and like other people like i mean angela davis alexis duvaux like a lot of people talk about like you know blues women and like that technology you know what i mean of the blues and like how do we like emote in the music like white folks were like you know they had their you know their classical music and classical music has emotion in a way but the blues is like hits you in your pussy like pow like I feel that feeling you know what I mean it's like I can't be at my neck with it like that's at my pussy like damn that shit you know what I'm saying that's the blues and like everything comes from the blues rock and roll all of that so I feel like little Richard like you know if you just you know, like, there's so many pictures that have come out of him in the last couple of days of just him being pretty. Like, just that Black male pretty. Like, Prince, just, oh, he's so pretty. Like, to me, like, I just think that's, you know, part of this, like, queer Black divinity space that, like, I still, like, you know, I, I love to play with in my work and reflect about in my life, you know? Yeah, it's as if the queerness is conjuring uh, and... And when you enter this space, you're you're expanded, and it's and growing in a way that you didn't maybe expect um, prior to engagement. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, and so, in, speaking of this conjuring and the sex magic, you wrote a, a short um, a short erotic story. Can you tell us about this story? I read half of it. It was like. <laughs> <laughs> 
my gosh. Yeah, and I sent you the rest. Um, well, hopefully, sorry, just because you're Ingrid. Um, but yeah, um, it's, uh, yeah, so I was hit up by Auto Straddle to write a piece of erotica. And Auto Straddle is like so dope. Like they're, black, um, no, like queer, lesbian, you know, sort of culture, you know, and they're very, you know, politicized and like, you know, um, really, you know, sort of like highlight and centralized BIPOC um, writers and creativity. Um, and yeah, they hit me up a couple of weeks ago being like, do you want to write erotica? And I'm like, hell yeah. Um, and like, and thinking about it, I was actually thinking about like, all right, how do I make this piece poetic? How do I make it like, sort of like, a, you know, evoke and like reflect like parts of my, you know, sort of desire, obviously. So it's fun. Um, like there's, you know, biking involved, there's camping, there's shrooming, you know what I mean? There's like, um, you know, a hot basketball, former WNBA player, <laughs> um, you know, just like shit that like, I think is fun. Um, and yes, yeah, so I was grateful that they asked me. Um, and it's a thing I've always wanted to do. And um, as of recently, I've started like collecting like vintage, like lesbian sort of like erotica and magazines and things like that um because like my sexuality I came out later in life too you know so yeah it feels like a Sankofa moment you know in that way too it's like you know how do I honor some of the ways that um I didn't get to like explore my desire and passions around my queerness until you know in my 20s I didn't get to I didn't do that you know so for the newbie queers in the room, what is it, what is it, any uh, advice about blossoming into the space uh, and feeling really comfortable? Uh, I think for a person like me who's been labeled straight, I've always said I was fluid, but labeled straight, you know, for most of my life, uh, I know I pause because there's a lot of politics to being queer mm -hmm. and I don't want to yeah. be disrespectful and uh, trying to respect all that the experiences people have had that I have not experienced simply because I was living a very straight life, right? Um, so I'm always wondering, like, how do I move into this space? Where do I fit? Any advice? <laughs> yeah, no, I think like it's, gosh, like I can't wait till you have your first pride parade. Because I went to Pride Parades all the time and I was, you know, also so-called straight. But there is something about being like, wow, like literally just even talking about it, like I feel my, what do they call this thing? My, um, my solar plexus just like Twitter a little bit. Because it was just like, oh yeah, like all of these. Because to me in ways, like I did repress my queerness, you know, like there are totally women I was attracted to and things like that. But I, I always felt insecure about being in that space and how do I navigate that? And I also was studying a lot of like black conscious thought and there was a lot of people who I interacted with and there was like a lot of, you know, there's so much homophobia, just like not so much in my family. Like my mom has always had queer friends, but, but also within my family and also within society, you know? Um, so I feel like, you know, just enjoy it. You know, like I think like read, like I just love reading about queer femmes because, you know, you're Femme, you seem like you're pretty femme and I think for me I also always love being femme but to me growing up it was kind of like oh if you're gay you're you know like there was always this way that I don't know it like talked about our femininity or called it into question in a way that I think that I've de been decolonizing and just like looking at the lineage of all these beautiful like you know queer femme women over time and queer masculine and non-binary because also like thinking about like our ancestors um our ancestors were queer and that's what's so beautiful about Cydia Hartman's book like she talks about the queerness that was happening in the Harlem Renaissance and in the blues you know during the time of you know jazz and things like that like these aren't new sort of things so I think like you know, just like giving yourself that like luxurious like study. Like I think for me, that's been so much of it. It's like, I'm like, oh my God, like that person was square too. And like, you just feel like you're part of like this really juicy, fun club. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like certainly as far as like politicization, like me and my wife, like my wife is Cameroonian and I'm of Caribbean descent. And, you know, I think there's so many powerful ways that people are doing some powerful decolonization work around the ways that homophobia exists all throughout the globe 
you know, including the United States, because the United States isn't like, you know, like the United States out here killing, you know, queer and trans bodies, you know, specifically trans bodies, you know, mm -hmm. um, Black trans bodies. So I do feel like there's ways that absorbing my queerness really deepened my politicization about the kinds of mm -hmm. people I stand up for, you know, like, not sadly, but I think it's just like, you know, we're a part of this like family in a way that's like different than being an ally. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like when you're a part of this family, it's like, yeah, like there's people out here who didn't like done shed some blood that done got, you know, mm -hmm. women who've been raped, all kinds of shit. You know what I mean? Just because we wanted to be ourselves, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I have to admit, um, all, uh, the ramifications, I guess, being out and queer in the world, haven't sunk in on me because of the quarantine. I've been in the night. Quarantine. You've been quarantined. <laughs> quarantine. <laughs> Happily so. Um, yes, I've been in this little utopian bubble uh, and uh, I feel very free and safe. And, you know, my partner has to remind me that we can't travel to all the countries in Africa, you know, and so it's, it's slowly but surely like coming into realization like, oh, my life has shifted. Um, I'm willing to adjust. But well, it would be good to talk about that. I think it's good to talk about traveling while queer in Africa because mm -hmm. me and my wife have done it twice. And I know a lot of queer Africans. And I, so I feel like it's certainly a, there's ways that we don't, I don't be kissing her in public, all this stuff. But I feel like she used to think before she came back home a couple of years ago, because she was like, didn't come home for like almost 20 years do my wife is also masculine presenting mm -hmm. so you know she felt particularly stigmatized but she's fortunately has been able to cry and Cameroon is one of the countries where it's illegal like you know and punishable and imprisonment mm -hmm. and all kinds of things so I do feel like I want to think about like how do we acknowledge that queer bodies are moving in all of these spaces and places and very beautiful and revolutionary ways because apparently there's queer clubs i'm like go oh we need to find one of these queer clubs in cameroon because of uh, all these straight catholic family members who i love <laughs> just kidding but yeah <laughs> where you know, are the queer folks at yeah i mean you definitely should come to south africa there's a very large queer uh community here it's humongous uh i i like to joke that all women are bi here <laughs> It's just culturally like very, very acceptable. And and mm -hmm. my partner moved here. She's American. Um, so it, it's interesting how, you know, some are to tolerated and some it's yes. illegal and dangerous, like in Uganda. And then, but here it's just really, it's, it's way easier. It's more. Yeah, and I think like, in Cameroon, what I observed is because gender expression, like, I find, like, African gender expression to be, have a lot of androgyny within it. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's ways that men express their masculinity in Cameroon, like, and this is, like, an anecdote I always say. When I was in Cameroon, you know how they have the motorcycle taxis? Yeah. And you'll see, like, three dudes, like, cock the booty on a mortar taxi. And I'm like, that shit would never happen in the States. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Men don't feel comfortable being behind a man, even on a motorized vehicle, right? It's so, you know, or like how women's hair, like a lot of women will have long hair, but a lot of women have short hair, you know? So I feel like there's ways where I'm like, oh, well, you don't look any more gay than half these women out here. You know what I'm saying? So, and people just assume me and her are sisters. Right. And I'm like, yeah, we sisters. Um, can you measure the fuck out this dress I'm trying to get made? Yeah, that's my cousin. <laughs> Whatever. Right. No, that's true. I, I like that. And that works. In Rwanda, you'll see men hold hands in the most loving way, like really lingering. It's like really beautiful. It's like, why can't we have this in the States? Uh, it would be wonderful. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, not that it's not like shit going down, but I just feel like there are ways that I've, I've noticed that we can move around that wasn't like, oh my gosh, they'll see you in the street and beat you down, which was the perception that I think some people might have, you know, so that's all. No, that's true. That's true. Um, so thinking about the future, what does queerness or queer culture have to offer for the our shaping of our futures? Of course, specifically Black queer culture. Mm -hmm. 
Oh my gosh. I think pleasure, 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 um, healing. I mean, if you ask my imagination, Mm -hmm. I really do feel like, you know, just like everything that was outlawed and broken down in the regime of patriarchy and like white supremacy, I think queerness was certainly a thing that was attacked, you know, because it held sacred roles. Um, and also recreational roles. Like I think queerness is a thing that a lot of people explore and experience um, without necessarily ending up in a committed relationship with somebody, you know, who's of the same sex or whatever. Um, So I think for me, like queerness, I think it offers the thing it's always wanted to offer. Like think about when there's like a party. I mean, not to be like that, but I just feel like when you're in spaces and it's queer spaces, it's just like joy filled, like even, you know, like the show Pose and like kind of all of these spaces where it's like, we have created a story around the way queerness exists in this culture. Queerness in this culture has always been shamanic. You know what I mean? It's always been like in the future. It's always, you know, played with gender. It's always, you know, played with the ways that power and sexuality is explored, you know? So I think in particularly the liberation of black bodies, I think like queerness is essential to where we don't feel ashamed. Like I think about so many artists who've given their lives, you know, and their collective magic to society, you know, who are queer, Mm -hmm. but had to hide that part of themselves. I think about so many of our family members you know, within our families who, you know, had to live closeted and not really gotten to like be fully embraced for who they are. Um, So I think like, I really want to live in a time where Black children um, of all genders feel like, yeah, like I could love a body that's like my beautiful brown body. I think that's what I love about queerness and being with women as a lesbian. Um, I'm like a percentage lesbian, a percentage queer. Um, cause you know, I kinda, I ain't got no type if I'm honest, but, um, in like the lesbianness that I get to ex- experience with my wife, it's like, ah, oh, her body's like brown and her body's like soft and it's strong. Like there's ways I get to love a dimension of myself through loving her body that I think is also like an interesting way that homophobia operates. Like if you're taught to like feel repulsed around bodies that look like yours when you would naturally desire them you know like what ways does that come out sideways Mm. so i feel like embracing queerness and not stigmatizing it because at the end of the day like there's so much emphasis on the body Mm. and the queerness of the bodies but not on the queerness of the soul of a relationship like what i love about being with a woman is certainly her body but it's like the lack of patriarchy (laughs) and the like opportunity to really alchemize on a soulful level. It's like, I don't want to constantly be proven why I don't have to be led by you just because you got something between your legs that I don't like, that's just not how we doing it. And that's how I was raised. You know what I mean? I was raised seeing that like my dad, you know, bless his heart, but could be up to the biggest fuckery. Mm -hmm. And he just would be like accepted for it. And like my mom would be like, yo, she bomb, she's sexy, she cook good, she's smart, she this. And she constantly was having to almost like prove her worth against other, like, it's just like, man, fuck this, like for real. Like be gay alone, I'm not having to deal with the patriarchy and the sexism. Like that shit alone is like. (laughs) (laughs) That is so true. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Yeah. I I I remember like my, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was gonna say this last thing. I remember like when I first started studying circus um, with this woman, Kate Lee Kalnick, and this is before I was out queer. And she was like this like out circus artist, black Jamaican, super dope. And she was like, yeah, yeah, like I, she just talked about like dating men just got boring. Like, and I just, that, I just remember something about that stuck with me. She's like, that whole shit just got boring to me. And I remember I was like, Huh. Cause she dated men and had a son and all that stuff. And I'd never heard anybody talk about it that way, especially, I mean, obviously she's attracted to all bodies. Yeah. And I think something about that just felt very elevated. She's an Aquarian, by the way. <laughs> something about that seemed elevated. Like, you know, why am I going to bore myself with the details of this fake ass system? You know what I mean? <laughs> Anyways, that's it. <laughs> It's true, you know, yes, dating men actually <laughs> started to bore me as well. Um, <laughs> oh. um, I, 
I was going to say that um, our friend Asad has these amazing parties that I mentioned earlier, and um, they're majority um, Black and POC queer parties. Uh, but as the straight girl, I, I always felt so free in those spaces. Like I could just finally be, just be myself. And I, I think that that freedom is one of the, the many things that queer culture can offer us. The, the mm -hmm. ability to explore all of us in our weirdness, in our magic, everything. Uh, I'm interested to know when our youth, you know, are growing and they're already kind of rejecting these labels and gender labels and all those things. Do you think that that's going to expand our capacity for humanity? Because that seems to be like the one thing that's lacking all over the earth. Mm -hmm. um, what is lacking? Like... Uh, our, our, our notion of humanity and actually caring about others deeply. So, mm -hmm. you know, you see in Michigan, um, white people have been protesting at the mm -hmm. Capitol to end the lockdown because they believe um, black people are dying because we're dying at a disproportionate rate. It's really high in Detroit. They're like, why should we lock down because black bodies are dying? Right, and so our sense of humanity mm -hmm. has been completely broken and lost, and, and it's been doing this for centuries and centuries and centuries. Mm -hmm. But something about relating with people just based on their humanness uh, mm -hmm. feels like that can help us to expand our notion of hum what humanity and like really institute it in other ways. Oh, yeah. I totally feel you on that i think like there's so many ways that uh, you know like if we truly kind of heal and get past whatever little fantasy that people who have these guns will sit up in michigan and think that like i'm protecting what are you protecting bro this is a fucking global pandemic that's killing people like your gun ain't gonna do shit for that mm -hmm. are you you know what i'm saying like this has been like the ethos and spirituality of white people and a lot of these white men you know since the time of their ancestors you know um who have their own trauma that they done passed on to the rest of the world you know so it's like you know thinking of the ways that people have you know been passed down from like all of their ancestors like yo there's something important about your whiteness there's something you know authoritarian or necessary about you know, um, your white body, you know, like, like as long as like that continues to be um, a thing that's unquestioned, which I think like, you know, that's what I hope is one of the outcomes of this moment is that like, you know, we're allowed to, you know, just actually heal and not constantly be distracted by white supremacy's assertion that it must be centralized and like cared for and, you know, served, you know, um, so, you know, that, that is what I hope. I do think there's aspects of queer culture that, you know, um, and black culture, you know, and, and they, those cultures overlap, you know, obviously too, black queer culture, like you were sharing, um, you know, that really is about like, how do we really sort of think collectively, you know, we're, we're forced into this sense of like marginalization from the center. So there's ways that we created new centers and made those centers reflect a ethos that made sense to our stuff. And it was always about healing. You know, like black spaces, when I'm in all black spaces, I'm like, oh, this just feels healing. Ah, we crazy up in here, we having fun. And same thing like you're talking about Asadalus parties, you know what I'm saying? It's just like we up in there, we dancing, we eating food, we passing something, we hugging people, we meeting people, we snuck, you know what I mean? It's just like a space that's like, and actually it's funny because those spaces have been like um, undermined and disrespected by like, you know, the, you know, position, people in positions of power. It's like, oh, y'all are lazy. It's like, just because we don't want to work for you for free doesn't mean we're lazy. It just means we came here for a different spiritual purpose than doing what y'all wanted us to do. Mm -hmm. And same thing with queer folks. It's kind of like, oh, party, party, la, la, la. And it's like, well, what else? We, I mean, yeah, we work, but like, that's not our identity. Our identity is community and the pleasure of being with community. So yeah, I totally agree or feel you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So what does the Afro future say for you? 
Ooh, what does the Afrofuture say? Like, what is my premonition of it? Yeah. What does it look like? Mmm. Aw. I like it. I think it looks very um, nourishing mm. and like slow. And I think it looks very like, just like spaces to honor the ancestors, you know, to talk about the ancestors, to include the ancestors. I love the ancestors. Um, I really hold them in my heart. Like just all of the things that we've had to navigate, all of the sort of quiet lives, you know, that you know, yes, there's people like Little Richard, but how many Little Richards were out there? You know what I mean? In our communities, like I, I hold, like the Afro future is holding space for all that we've been and doesn't cut us off from that. Um, the Afro future is very pansexual and polyamory and queer and asexual and shamanic and weird. Um, it's very much not a lot of time spent in working for white folks. Like that's not going to be a happening like you know we don't take care of the food we're gonna take care of what we need we're gonna innovate we're gonna make spiritual technologies we're gonna make ancestral and healing technologies but we're not gonna be making technologies that's about making money like that's not the vibration um the afro future um is very what's the word yeah it's very much we cleaning up this planet we're connecting to the indigeneity of all of the land, you know, the indigeneity and the indigenous people of this land that we have, you know, diaspora to, as well as the indigenous land of Africa. Like I think for me going to Africa was the first time to understand my blackness as an indigenous blackness. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and obviously I'm a kid of the diaspora. I've for several generations haven't lived on the land of my black and African ancestors, but going to Africa and getting to be around all of those like levels of spiritual divinity it really reminded me like yeah like I'm from an indigenous people and like how do we connect to the land and the divinity that vibrates from all of these different lands you know um and technologies of divinity that vibrates from land mm -hmm. um a lot of good food in the Afro future <laughs> I love that. I want to be in your Afro future. <laughs> come, baby. Come, baby. <laughs> oh, Ava. Uh, I, Listen, I love Ava. Ava's like one of my homies who was like, we literally were hella tight in a past life, like super tight. But now we know each other, you know, via the interwebs. Let's see. see. We, we have a question. Um, does it sometimes feel like it's necessary to vocalize, um, I'm sorry, to vocalize this. Like, is it enough to know it for yourself to be queer and internally acknowledge, or is part of that transition to queerness declarative? Can you speak to the feeling um, like it's also an exchange with our community? Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's a dope question. I mean, I, I'll answer, but also to like Ingrid, I think like as a, you know, newly, you know, embarked, because obviously you've always been queer and we've always been queer, you know, a, a lot of us. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think, um, yes, yeah, so I would love to hear your feelings about like, yeah, like, is it a thing that you feel like you need to post on social media, especially since you're in quarantine? Um, or is it a thing where you're like, yo, if you caught the Zoom and you heard me talking about it with Janata, then you found out about it. <laughs> um yeah 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 um yeah do you want to talk first and I could talk next well I was just gonna say that I actually wrote a short essay about it and I haven't of you did. Uh, edited or uh revisited and my partner wants <laughs> to see it um I I want there was an article um you might have seen it uh, is it bustle uh the online magazine and they were talking about you need a lesbian right now during. Oh, I love that one. That one was hilarious. I was like, baby, was look like, at this. Oh my God. Go on. <laughs> I was like, I got one. I got one. <laughs> See, Afro Future, I was ready. I was ready. <laughs> I was already on it. <laughs> um, but I, because I'm such a free spirit, I don't feel like I'm out or in. I'm just, mm -hmm. and I, and I love someone who happens to be a woman. So 
you know, it is what it is for me. But I also, my entire community across the globe is, is very loving, accepting, and probably 70% queer anyway. So it doesn't like, it doesn't change anything for me. And as long, you know, my mom's fine with, everybody's fine with it. You know, my mom loves her, like every, everybody's good. So my life is pretty easy. Uh, so I, I, this to me is very public, but it doesn't bother me at all. Mm -hmm. Well, I also think it's interesting because, you know, like, yeah, like I think we should just be allowed to just be and kind of figure it out for ourselves in ways, you know? Um, I do think like there's something nice about like when I started to kind of be out to everybody being like, oh yeah, like this is who I am. Like it allowed me to just be myself, you know, um, in a way that I think not sharing it felt like it was holding back on some level. Like part of it is like, I needed to just kind of do it for myself, you know? Um, but I do feel like, you know, it does feel beautiful to be embraced as a person in the queer community. Cause you're just like, it's kind of like when, I don't know. And it's similar to like within black spaces. Like I feel like there is a time where it's like, and I have friends from all over and of all kinds of backgrounds, especially in Minneapolis. I have so many friends who are white, but I remember when I was really like, yo, I'm black. And I'm like, mm, I'm black. Mm, mm. It was kind of the same way. It was just kind of like, you know, when you at the party and so to me, it's like, I think so much of coming out has so much trauma and so many spaces you know, like, it really is a thing that, like, will sometimes end in violence to some spaces. But, oh, I was going to ask you this question um, around sort of what is the power of coming out? Like, you know, just kind of like in some ways, maybe I was protecting myself in a way. Um, or there's things about myself and not just coming out as queer, but also as poly, you know, later in life. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, like, these were things obviously I always was, you know, and there's a part of me that mourns like not hooking up with a whole bunch of fine women when I lived in New York. <laughs> but, um, duck tear. Just kidding. Um, but, um, <laughs> but otherwise it's kind of like, oh yeah, like I did it when I did it. And you know, it, anyhow, I don't, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Do you, do you wish you would have came out earlier or started dating women earlier maybe? Yeah. I mean, I think I was always open to it. It just didn't happen to me. Um, and you know, my girl is on here, Anya, and I, I would speak to her about, like, you know, a woman might pause to want to speak to me, but then, like, run away, and, you know, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I was always open, but I was never the one to, like, kind of introduce it or, you know, more uh, forward about it. I, I didn't have any women. Um, I, I was going to say something else, but... It is, it's, I feel yeah. like now I'm part of a club that I was totally excluded from before. <laughs> and so a part of me wants to tell all of my queer friends that I, I'm in partnership with a woman, simply because I want to have a deeper connection and be like, can you invite me to the party mm -hmm. too now? Because <laughs> I, I, I can, I, for whatever reason, I really felt the exclusion. Like I, I felt some kind of no, way. Totally. <laughs> And maybe that was some part of me saying, well, actually, because <laughs> you're gay, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but I, yeah, I've always felt like, oh, you know, I really want to participate or mourn with you or celebrate with you. And I'm not, I always hear about it after the fact. And so now, uh, now uh, I feel like uh, I could be part uh, of that conversation more. Uh, it stopped. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, the you. recording stopped? Uh, it did not stop. <laughs> oh, sorry, we didn't record. We're not recording, sorry. We are I'm recording. We are recording. Oh, we are, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's fine, it's good. Uh, uh, these are really, oh, you guys are so sweet. You're welcome, oh, you're welcome. Yeah, check out the chat. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you have any last thoughts? Um, yeah, no, I just am like, this has like been such a fun conversation. I did not know we were going to be having this conversation. I didn't know what conversation we were going to be having. 
but I love just hearing your insights actually about like, like, what do you feel? Oh, okay. This is a question I have for you, Ingrid. What do you feel like your queerness has added to your understanding of Afrofuturism as far as how you live it? Mm. I mean, number one, I've always thought black lesbians make the best superheroes, period, hands down. Period, period. Period. <laughs> they are just so badass. You're just like, yes. And they're and sexy they and they're just like this dom energy, like. Mm. Right, and it's the position. Like Megan the Stallion, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it's the position of all the energies, I think. It, mm -hmm. it comes together really well in a, in a, in a woman, specifically. Um, I just, yeah, there's a certain level of strength that has always been empowering for me. Mm. Uh, I, my Afro future always was open and expanded and included everyone. So I don't think that too much has really shifted but now I'm intimately linked to another community. And so, yeah, that community probably will have a deeper presence over time in my life, which I'm really open to. Uh, and I think that we need to make sure it's part of the conversation when we're talking about the Afro future, that it is present, um, not just feminism, but also lesbians, gays, queers, LGBTQIA. So I think the whole spectrum needs to always be present so that we understand the fullness of our lives and, and how beautiful they can be because everyone, you know, offers something, right? A new dimension. Yeah, it just created- yeah, And Afrofuture is so queer, you know? Like Afrofuturism, <laughs> I think it's so inherently queer too, right? Right, it's like the- mm -hmm. Yes, a twist on that, on the future, right? And our, and our future is different, right? It's not just some linear out there thing. No, it's some, a magical multi-dimensional multi experience that is ongoing and daily. And I, I, I wonder if people really understand being an Afrofuturist, you don't take it off and on. You are an Afrofuturist every day, just like you're queer every day and black every day. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. women every day, you know, the, it's, it's, it's just a part of who you are. So, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. It's a great space to, to live in. Uh, mm. So where can we find out about your work? Oh, yeah. So I have a website, janata.com, um, J-U-N-A-U-D-A.com. Mm -hmm. And um, what else? Yeah, that has like some of the stuff I do. I'm on Instagram. Um, I'm on Twitter. Um, yeah, I yeah, I wrote a book um, called The Stars and the Blackness Between Them. I'm in pleasure activism. I think you're in pleasure activism or maybe you're in emerging strategy. I am. I am in pleasure activism. <laughs> in pleasure activism. Okay, I was right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, that's where my, some of my writing lives. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, definitely follow Janata because there are some beautiful projects in the works that you will want to know about immediately when she speaks about it and you're going to want to support it. Uh, but before we go... Oh, but I, I'm having a second book. I do have a second book coming out in a year or so that I'm started working on. Oh. So that's some news I can share and I'm working with the same... Um, I mean, I don't know if I can share it. I mean, whatever. It's, it, I'm working on the book regardless of what the details I was about to say about the book, but it's going down. So okay. look out for it. I, I wanted to ask you, what does pleasure activism look like for you? Oh my gosh. I mean, what it's been for me personally, it's been a lot of this kind of personal work around uh, sort of allowing myself to center in the pleasure that I already was creating in this world with my art, but to embody it. Um, and I think certainly embody it um, within my sort of relationships, but specifically my relationship with myself. Like, I think I held a lot of shame and kind of repression of my full self. Um, and I think for me, pleasure activism has also been like the work of my book and the work of the art that I make. Um, I think with the book, I really was like, yeah, like it's a young adult book. So it's kind of subversive in that way, you know, where... Um, young people could read it, but a lot of people of all ages read young adult. Um, and 
yeah, I feel like for me in the book, like the book is so much about pleasure. It's so much about like, you know, like there's female masturbation in it. There's like girls making out. There's just like, you know, a lot of, you know, girls, you know, experimenting with boys and figuring out what that is. And, you know, um, I think there's, I wanted to give permission to all people, but particularly with Black kids and Black queer kids or Black questioning kids. And I think like somebody recently I was in a conversation with talked about the importance of questioning. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like this idea that like, yeah, we don't, this declarative thing, I mean, kind of what you were talking about too, Ava, it's like this idea that, oh yeah, like this, oh yeah, you got to know it and then you got to declare it either way. Whereas so much of life is just organic and you're just embodying who you are and embodying a moment and people that, you know, spark something. So I think um, pleasure activism to me has really lived in like, yeah, like how do I create a space within like the literary universe for like specifically black queer kids to be like, oh yeah, like I can make out with a boy today. I could try making out with a girl another time and blah, 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 blah. And it's all gravy. It's all good in the hood. So. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. That's, that's a perfect way to end our wonderful conversation. You brought so much light into my evening. <laughs> I appreciate it. Oh yeah, I know it's like, noon here or something right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh so yes we are recording this entire conversation and i usually post it on youtube i don't know give me some days just give me time but it it, it depends how much editing i do and how much time i want to dedicate to it um <laughs> So about a couple days, it should be up. So definitely look for it. And uh, thank you, Janata, for speaking with me and being on here. And thank you to the attendees for coming. Thank y'all. Yes, I love seeing the familiar uh, names. Yeah, I didn't and, even look to see who's here because I didn't want to get shy. What'd you say? I said I didn't want to even see who was here because I didn't want to get shy, but I knew Ava. Uh, <laughs> I know. Yeah, definitely <laughs> who's here. And uh, so tomorrow I'm speaking to Don Bim Crony. Crony. He is a filmmaker and uh, I've shown his shorts before. I'm really excited to hear what's going on with him. He's out of Los Angeles. So tomorrow is our conversation. We'll be moving into the fantastical film space. Uh, we will be here same time, 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time and 6 p.m. Joburg Time. I'll see you here on Zoom. Thank you again. Love you. Bye. <laughs> okay.